Good evening. I'm Eric Orwell Castillo, and on behalf of the Anthropology Graduate Student Organization, ISA, I'd like to thank the lectures program, the Anthropology Department, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for sponsoring this lecture. And of course, I'd also like to thank you all for being here. Our speaker tonight is a scientist whose field of interest is human culture in all its complexities. Not only are his research interests in culture, they are in prehistoric culture. Thus, the scientist's data are the prehistoric remains of cultural processes. In other words, he's an anthropological archaeologist. He received his BA from the University of North Carolina, his master's in anthropology from the University of Michigan, and his PhD, also in anthropology, from the University of Michigan in 1964. He has held university positions at the University of Chicago, the University of California at Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, the University of New Mexico, and Southern Methodist University. He is Professor Emeritus at Southern Methodist University and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He is often referred to as the leader of the new or processual archaeology, a movement that began in the 1960s by archaeologists interested in a scientific approach to understanding archaeological remains. His contributions to archaeological thinking were well summarized in a recent review of his latest tome, Constructing Frames of Reference, where the reviewer wrote, and I quote, most of the theoretical writing by other archaeologists during the 1990s was in reaction to or in support of that program, that program being the new archaeology. Perhaps counterintuitively, our speaker has vigorously argued that the archaeologist does not discover the past and that, in fact, archaeologists observe and study the present, well, in order to make sound statements about the past and that it is in this linkage from present observations to inferences about the past where the utmost scientific rigor is required. Leading by example, he spent many field seasons collecting data on contemporary hunter-gatherer peoples and on the character of the future archaeology they create. Based on his results, he has written several books and other publications arguing and theorizing about how archaeologists can link the static archaeological remains we, are, we uncover to the dynamic processes responsible for shaping this archaeology. To be honest, I was a bit nervous when I realized that I would introduce our speaker this, this evening. And frankly, I did not know how to successfully convey the degree of impact that he has had on the field of archaeology. So I took the advice of one of his former students when he told me, I quote, Lou has always liked analysis better than description. Well then, armed with that unsurprising piece of information, I decided to collect my own data. Using the available record of citations as a proxy for what I will call contribution intensity, I compared our speaker citation record to 14 other well-known and well-regarded archaeologists, also members of the National Academy of Sciences. My results indicate that our speaker's research has been cited 70% more times than the average of the other 14. Needless to say, his impact has been significant at the .05 level. <laughs> Tonight, this gentleman will share some of his new research with us in a lecture entitled, Beachcombers, Hillbillies, and Flatlanders, Exploring the Impact of Geographic Setting on Hunter-Gatherer Adaptation. Please help me give a, dyna a dynamite welcome to our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Lewis Binford. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, one of the unique things about it, from my perspective, is that they had sense enough to give me a title and not ask me to do it myself. <clears throat> so I spent some time trying to put things together in a way that might make sense in terms of the title. Uh, fortunately, it was not so far away from the research that I'm currently doing for another book. 
in which I'm trying to actually build some of the arguments as to uh, what it is that conditions variability among known, ethnographically known, hunters and gatherers on a global scale. And those peoples that are documented in such a fashion that this is even feasible represent only 139 different groups of uh, social units that have been studied by anthropologists. So almost everything I'll have to say is talking tonight about variability among some of those 139 case, documented cases of hunting and gathering peoples. That is, people who didn't plant any domesticated plants and who uh, uh, were, were not dependent in any way on uh, uh, domesticated animals, uh, with the exception of dogs, <laughs> so as we'll see early on in the evening. The, uh, the, the title uh, I thought was neat because I've been worrying with, after I did the big comparative book on hunters and gatherers, I began to worry with, as any scientist should, that terrible, terrible phrase that scientists are supposed to be dedicated to, which is in quotes, what are the other things that must be equal for what you say to be true? Well, that basically in science they say, what are the other things that are equal? Most of the time, that is a category of ignorance. <laughs> We don't know what's equal. And I've been trying to do research in such a way as to find out what is and isn't equal among a variety of things that are rarely talked about, such as whether you're a beachcomber or whether you live at high altitudes or, or whatever, the simple geography and those kinds of things. Uh, and <clears throat> so, uh, it was kind of fun to r do work ahead of myself. Usually I do lectures after I've finished something. Uh, but this time I had to speed up the process and do a lot of work uh, before I had finished something. And the best way to do it was to try and share with you some of my own research experiences. And that's what I'm going to try to do this evening things that open my eyes uh, in various parts of the world. And of course, the ethnographic group that I spent more time with and uh, visited many, many times uh, is a group from the Arctic, uh, which uh, is known as the Nunamut Eskimo. But before I start that, I want to show you something about the distribution of the 339 cases, which is on here where we have the mean elevation above sea level and the maximum range in elevational variability within the territory within which they live. Uh, <clears throat> and you see we've got a scatter here. And uh, by the conventions that I use to distinguish between uh, uh, lowlands, hills, and mountains. These are all uh, lowlands and hills, and these are the mountains, and one way over. And then these are interesting. Uh, these are all of the cases of hunters and gatherers from Africa, except that, and that is the only one that's up here. These are all on the high plateau. Africa itself as a continent is a high plateau. There are very few rivers that drain evenly into the water. They cascade into the oceans uh, so that it, the whole continent is elevated and then segments of it are elevated more than others. And so you've got these uh, plateau effects in various parts of Africa and these are the uh, the cases that are on those high plateaus that are hunters and gatherers. And we'll look at some of them tonight. And then these up here are right here in the United States. 
in the high plateau, on which we tend to call the Great Basin between the Rockies and the, uh, the California ranges of mountains. But that is a high plateau. But there also, it has greater max range differences than do the plateaus of Africa. So that means walking is more difficult. Uh, the energy costs of living there is also more difficult. And so this is the range of variability just in terms of these two things uh, for the cases that I'm be talking about and summarizing this evening. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm going to start with the one I know best, and that is the, the high Arctic cases. And uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, <laughs> I'm going to start with the one in which I have the least data on that are also interesting. Uh, next. And we, these are Google photographs. We, we've all heard about the wonders of the northwest coast of North America, I think, having complex hunters and gatherers and stratified systems and hierarchies of leadership and also universally dependent upon uh, aquatic resources to, in a large measure. This is just a Google photograph of the straits up f above Vancouver where many of those groups of hunters and gatherers lived aboriginally. And you can see all of these streams going up into the interior, all these streams going, which means that the, the mountain, coast mountain ranges are strongly dissected. And you've got, if you just start taking the actual miles of adjacent water through this kind of territory, you've just got an amazing amount of beachcombers. <laughs> uh, and uh, on the other hand, if we, we look at the next picture, which is uh, something else important about those people, these are dry, uh, salmon that have been caught and are drying in the houses of the hunters and gatherers of the Northwest Coast. One of the major sources of food all year round was the stored uh, salmon that they took during the salmon runs. Now, salmon is an interesting fish because it's what's known as an anadromous fish. It uh, basically lives its adult life in the salt water, but it returns to fresh water every year to spawn. And uh, <clears throat> so that every year you can count on the huge runs of salmon all up those streams I showed you. And the people can uh, trap them. They, they, they do trap them in fish traps. They can take them in weirs. Uh, and they can impound them, even, and uh, store them uh, in the water that they should be swimming in, but they can't get out uh, in order to delay the possible uh, that they get caught up in the labor crunch of having to process so much before decay starts. So they store them alive in pounds and so forth and so on and get to it later. Uh, and the, the houses, the, the famous houses, these are residential structures, uh, are well built, they're stable, they're sedentary in them. And uh, the, the insides of these houses have uh, uh, multiple families. So these are many of them communal houses with apartment-like organization and a huge amount of cooperation between the residents of a single house. So these are complex societies in social terms, in ideological terms, and in terms of the products that they produce. The wood carvings and so forth are just uh, incredible. Uh, so we, we'll call those complex hunters and gatherers. Uh, they don't move around very much except in their own little patch. Next. Now I'm jumping to the Straits of Magellan in Argentina, where there's hunters and gatherers who, uh, two of the groups that I will be showing you some houses of, uh, are called the Ona and the Yagan that lived in the Straits here. What do you see? You've got 
linkages between these drainages, but that's all seawater. All of this is seawater, not fresh water. And so you really don't have a freshwater hydrological regime because these mountains go way up. And when you cross, for instance, the first time I ever flew over uh, the caldera, uh, Argentina was playing for the World Cup in Europe, and the pilot said, we're not going to fly to Ushuaia, which is down here, uh, until the game is over. I want to know what, and we're all sitting in, just watching the World Cup in Europe, waiting for the pilot to decide, okay, we're going to fly again. He said, I, I can't be nervous flying over the caldera. Well, <laughs> we didn't know what that meant <laughs> before <laughs> he did, because the airstrip at, uh, at the, where we were, was here, the caldera is here, and the top is here, and if the top here is 20 times, is that 20 times, 20, 20 times the tallest building in the United States at that time, uh, and you've got to go this way because the wind is coming this way, you've got to fly right into the side of the mountain turn and go up and the air is getting lighter and lighter and lighter, you get off on the other side, you got to land on a little piece of land, let's say like that, that's been bulldozed out. And you got to hit it just right because you're coming down just like this and you've got to straighten out like you will not believe the, the G's when that happens. <laughs> And then you've got to stop before you go into the water. Uh, I, I must admit, I was a bit uh, glad to get out of that airplane that day. <laughs> but this is all salt water. And there are no freshwater streams. And when we actually ask the question, where, what is the distribution of anadromous fish, like all those salmon? On the Pacific coast, Ensenada, Mexico is the furthest south any anadromous fish go. There are no anadromous fish in the rivers of South America. <coughs> None. So the resource and the behavior of that fish is at least conditions that are different. They're all dependent upon saltwater species here. And uh, Naturally dead whales, uh, attacking seal rookeries, mainly sea mammals are what these people eat, living in these houses as opposed to the ones you saw a minute ago on the northwest coast. They've got high labor intensity, low encounter rate with food. And so the, the low population densities are extremely uh, low and their security is extremely low. So we, we've got something to go on with the anadromous fish and the difference between salt water here and salt water up in the northern hemisphere, which grades into fresh water in those great bays or the mouth of the uh, major rivers. And you've got a totally different kind of relationship between fish and, and land. And uh, so, these people are behaving like I would call foragers. That is, the ones on the northwest coast are going to certain places that they can either build things and it uh, makes it possible for them to take lots of salmon and then bringing them back to their houses and putting them in storage. This is a logistical strategy. You can divide up the division of labor. You can have females doing something, males doing another. Uh, the ones who are actually going out hunting aren't really going very far. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that it's, it, you're, not, uh, you're not moving your residences. You're not moving those great houses. They're sedentary. And once you've got those kinds of year after year associations between people, you begin to get these uh, leadership hierarchies and ownership hierarchies, and they absolutely are also talking about ownership in the, in the Northwest Coast. 
this house owns this suite of shell beds and uh, uh, fish fishing possibilities, and this house moves, owns another one, uh, is the way the actual landscape is brought up. And people inherit the rights over time to use old granddad or whoever <laughs> was the origin of the lineage was the first one to live there. One, one other interesting thing. Uh, if you go up the northwest coast and begin to ask people when, the, when they're using fish wheels and uh, things like that, uh, they are in sometimes what are called fish camps. Uh, well, what are you doing here? Don't you live in such and such a house? Uh, yeah, we live in such and that. Why, why are you here? Because my great, great, great grandfather was the first one to build, build a fish weir here, and so it's ours. So property rights are made on a part of primogeniture of presence. And uh, that's passed down through time. So further generations inherit the right to hunt, or I mean fish, at these different well-known locations. And when you have absolute population data, you find something really interesting. <laughs> and that is the pattern the early occupants got the best places. That's where the big houses are. But as they got more people in them over time, they first go to temporary fish camps further up river, which is more to transport, all right? And they s take fish there. The first ones to take fish there add that place to old great-great-granddad's places. That's our group's places. So you can actually interview people and see what the rate of increase was in the population from the rate of increase in fishing locations and these kinds of things. All that. So ownership of land is, is really real. It's put into place organizationally up there on the northwest coast down here, there's no ownership except that uh, politeness. If a, if a whale washes up and family A sees it and starts butchering, the word may get out to their relatives. Uh, they then come to share in, in the meat. But the chances of another whale being in exactly the same place <laughs> next year is low. So nobody claims land that way. So they're organized very differently. So let's say here's two examples of what? River uh, peoples, beachcombers uh, can be put in here too in some other places if I had the photos. Uh, that the local uh, topography, the local characteristic of the resources themselves is conditioning very, very different kinds of organization all the way through the, how complex the political systems were and ownership claims were uh, between these two cases. Uh, if we uh, shift now to, we stayed in the southern hemisphere. This is the southern end of the South Island of New Zealand. And you see these two little islands? These weren't occupied early. The island of New Zealand was populated by boatloads of Polynesians who discovered the islands, actually brought domesticated plants with them. And they, the North Island, is the first one to be occupied because once you got a settlement, there was communication back and more people came. The South Island, they were able to use uh, domesticated plants because the environment was warm, warm enough to do the plants that they would bring from Polynesia. So that the early occupants, previously these New Zealand islands were not occupied, were occupied by 
Polynesian immigrants bringing their own domesticated plants, which nicely could still be used on the North Island, where it was warmer. But the, both of these islands are long, and uh, the North Island, uh, it, uh, in the early days of occupancy, had plants at the north end, and the local people began doing exploiting the wild animals at the south end because it was a little bit too cold for the plants that they brought. And with not much time involved, we're, we're talking, of, talking about maybe three generations, the they animals that were being exploited in the so at the south end, two of the species became extinct from over-exploitation. So they began to experiment with cultivating and then domesticating natural plants from this place, and some of it worked. So this South Island was then spread out from the North Island, going further south, getting colder and colder. Uh, they couldn't do any domesticated plants at all, and the South Island was fully dependent upon exploiting terrestrial resources from the South Island. Uh, it didn't take long for the population to grow rapidly, and so these two islands were peopled by people from the South Island. Now these are small islands, there was no question that you're not doing any plant stuff here, we're, we're going pretty south. Uh, but they began to do something very interesting. They begin to exploit the marine resources uh, in this organizationally speaking in a totally different way. They exploited marine resources and terrestrial resources in terms of the sequence when the edible material comes available during the year. So they were essentially from a year perspective totally mobile, no permanent houses, moving temporary housing uh, to the next patch that had a different thing until it was gone, then we'd go to the next patch. And technically I call those kind of hunters and gatherers foragers because they're not, they don't have specialized labor forces that bring food back to, to them. They're moving to the points of procurement, consuming it there, and then going to another one. Do you, do you see? Uh, that's what was going on at the Straits of Magellan I just talked about. Uh, so that, so here's two cases we can add to the Straits of Magellan, which are not straits, they're tiny islands. They're doing marine resources uh, and terrestrial resources together, whereas on the Straits of Magellan, they're only doing marine resources. Next. Uh, I, I'll add one thing to that example. The uh, <coughs> there are places in the world where we know they were hunters and gatherers, but all we have is an archaeological record. We don't have ethnography like this to talk about. So <coughs> here's some really interesting cases that we can study and study the character of the archaeological record that can be said to refer to the character of the ecology of the systems in which they're uh, getting their food and begin to build up a, a series of models that will allow us to look at the archaeological consequences of what's going on here to see if it's similar or different in another place for which we have no information. So that's one of the goals of doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm going to turn to a totally different kind of environment, one which I know m more about. Uh, and this is a Google, um, and Anactivic Pass, Alaska, is right at the continental divide of the river systems. That is, the river's going to the Arctic Sea here, and 
other rivers f actually as far away from here to the wall, one can be going to the Arctic Sea, the other one going to the Yukon. Uh, with just minor differences in elevation causing your drainage differences. So you're right at the top of both drainage systems. And this is a very mountainous area. And uh, the, 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 these people, although they were, they were mobile, uh, they did a lot more of, of what I would call uh, they, their, their, uh, their strategies of getting food were much more flexible. Sometimes they were behaving like the Northwest Coast and putting up stores, and you'll be seeing this. Other times they're going to places to consume rather than transporting the food to another place. Uh, this is looking uh, up towards the, this is the, the uh, right around this bend is where the village was. And this is the main drainage going down to the Yukon. And then right beyond this, it goes to the Arctic Sea. And this is springtime. Uh, next. And <coughs> just to, this is an artist reconstruction of perishable uh, traps that were used in those mountains you just saw, uh, one kind, so that they, what they would have is a, a noose suspended in these boxes and then vegetation filling between the doors, so to speak. And when the animal with antlers uh, goes to go through, they get caught. And then there's big rocks and stuff to which the noose is attached, and they can't get away. Uh, so they stay fresh. For <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, flies don't get them. Uh, and the, the men come and shoot these animals, but they know too much. They actually don't shoot to kill them. They've learned that if they get if the animals were coming down through here and, and getting caught here and the heads are here, then behind they had built a little platform about a foot and a half high back of where the animal's feet would be. That was enough for them to stand on with a bow and be able to shoot down so that they shoot through the diaphragm but, fram but don't hit the lungs. So the animal can't breathe very well. It can't run, and you can take a stick and walk it down out of the mountains to where you want to kill it and kill it at, at your place that suits you <laughs> because it can't do anything. Now, these guys are good shots. Uh, teaching youngsters sometimes results in actually deciding to eat a meal up there. Uh, <laughs> but here's a whole set of strategies in which you're using your prey as your transport. Uh, how many other kind of animals can be done? I ne I ne never occurred to me that you could shoot the diaphragm and not hit the lungs, but, but they do it. The angle's got to be right, and do it regularly, and let's go. Uh, so here, here's a group of people with some interesting strategies, because the labor bringing meat out of the mountains is staggering uh, for the men to have to carry that beside their own weight. So if we can get our prey to get themselves down under our control, we're doing pretty well. So they've learned all these kinds of strategies. Uh, okay. Uh, that's not the only kind of trap. <laughs> this is a deadfall trap with a trigger in here and inside is usually an atlas vertebra of a reindeer that's got meat on it. And it's stuck on the end of that stick. And then this stick is supporting the weight which kills the animal after he steps his front legs inside and his chest is on that sill. What they're going for is wolves, mainly, or wolverine, which, uh, 
make really good decoration uh, on parkas. Uh, and uh, so here they're, they're hunting for clothing materials to be used in clothing production. And they're not eating anything. So you find a collapsed one of these. This is one. This is the big weight. Here's the sills around the side that have been pushed over. And <clears throat> when, you, when you find these, you not infrequently find a limited number of wolf bones or uh, wolverine bones uh, nearby. What, because the men who are in the mountains have got their pack dogs with them. They feed their dogs up there and don't have to call, haul it out to, and feed them good meat, they would say. This is not good meat. So here we got another strategy of using prey to solve a problem, uh, which is totally, and at the same time, the male labor forces are small here, one or two men at most doing this kind of stuff, uh, not big groups of people like would be doing the fish weirs in the, in the coastal case. Next. Uh, you, you need to be careful in this setting. Uh, this is a female grizzly who adopted my crew one year because we were digging an archaeological site in the willows in the vegetation. And every day we made a cut. There are all these wonderful roots that are exposed in the cut. Grizzly would come in there at night and just tear our profiles down and eat the roots and uh, go to sleep. <laughs> and uh, we, did, we, just, we decided uh, we didn't want a grizzly bear sleeping where we were going to work. Uh, so so uh, this, I guess the first night we decided we had to get rid of the grizzly bear. Well, the Eskimos were perfectly happy to kill it. We thought that was a, there was a lot of people on the crew that weren't happy with that. Uh, so there was uh, one young woman who is now the uh, chairman of the department at a large university in the United States who was on my crew then, and she had a tent. And she went out to follow the cause, uh, call of nature and stepped on this guy sleeping. Scared the hell out of the grizzly bear. <laughs> it jumped. She screamed. That bear took off, and we never saw it again. <laughs> so, we big neat solution to a difficult problem. <laughs> now, you'll say, okay, there's a dead caribou. I tell you, that is a wolf kill, not a human kill. Uh, Several things about it make me certain of that. First, there's all kinds of hair around here. And the wolves tearing into the skin to be able to eat simultaneously pull lots of hair out and try to eat into good parts. But uh, the problem with a big male reindeer, they've got a great rack here. And uh, so when humans kill it, and I'll show you this, they cut a saw, cut the antlers off. They're going to use them. And so now the body can be moved in a, a more advantageous way for butchering it because it's not anchored by those big antlers. Uh, when you see this on the Arctic Slope, you, you're pretty certain this is a wolf kill. Uh, also, the scat laying around, which uh, is there, it is wolves. So. Uh, this looks like humans to me. Uh, they've removed not only the antlers with uh, saws, but the whole base of the skull or the whole head, pile them out of the way because they're not interested in that head for it, in this particular case. They may use it for snack here, but not to carry back to the, to the, to the village. They're interested in good lean meat. And so here is a... a uh, winter kill, there's practically no hair uh, relative to, uh, here's a head that had hair on it, another one over here, and there's no scat, and there's no gnawing on uh, the antlers. You can begin to tell the difference really quick, begin to see what's the condition of 
animals killing animals and humans killing animals. For instance, uh, in winter, of course, this is frozen. Uh, lakes are frozen and quite deep. Uh, wolves can outrun caribou on the ice. Uh, and you see up here caribou moving, and they move in a trail. The wolves just walking in the trail that the caribou made until you get to where they know there is a frozen lake. Then the wolves start chasing caribou. The caribou go out on the lake and start slipping all over the place. The wolves eat them. <laughs> uh, Eskimo knows this too. So they will fre frequently uh, put young men hidden along trails that are approaching a lake. And the men will jump out with a, with a, with a uh, piece of skins and flap at the car caribou. Caribou run towards the lake. Uh, they run towards the lake, sometimes so do the wolves. Uh, usually the people can get the wolves away uh, and satisfactorily butcher a caribou. Now I bring this up because uh, about two years ago, the Germans announced they'd found an amazing site, and it, it was an amazing site. It was quite old, uh, with uh, uh, dead caribou, uh, with what they call spears, which were spears. Uh, but they imagine that the caribou was swimming in the lake, and the men on the lake shore were throwing these spears out. Uh, now, from my perspective, it was wonderful because they told me what the tree was. It was a black spruce. Really? That's exactly what all the people in the Arctic make spears out of. And they do it by each is individual. You go up to saplings and you put your hand out so that you get that diameter at your height. It means it's heavier downstairs. Then you reach down while holding, as far as you can, and touch the bottom. That's where you cut it off and sharpen it, and it'll fit your body perfectly. Uh, now, these are not for throwing at caribou on a lake. These, are <laughs> these spears are, are used to set in the ground and uh, get an animal to charge, or uh, that's one of the primary uses of them. Uh, they're used for other ways of setting up spears in, in a trap, such that uh, the trap is, doesn't entrap the animal, it scares it. It's like on a spring, and it goes plong, plong, and the animal run, runs into the spears. And uh, then you've got speared animals on a lake. When the ice melts, it all goes by the lake. In Alaska, there's, I've never seen a lake that wasn't covered in bones at the bottom. Whether it's 27 feet deep, whether what it is, it's solid bones at the bottom. Of the accumulated deaths of wolves and, and whatever the animals were, or as humans and animals. So that the spears were not throwing spears. They were, the Germans interpreted this as the best javelin throwers in the world at 35,000 or whatever it was. Uh, all the spears are made exactly alike, in the same proportions. <laughs> uh, so there's all kinds of things you probably didn't know you needed to know to be in this profession at any one point in time. <laughs> but this is a human kill, winter. Uh, this is a view inside winter village of these people. This is a buried sod house. The snow here is a probably about five and a half feet thick. And uh, these are the uh, meat racks for in summer where they dry meat, in winter where they uh, hang the big caribou skins that are used for, by the men when they go in the bush to be floor, flooring of their tent to wrap up uh, uh, the, themselves so they can sleep on the sleds on occasionally. They're, they're used mainly as bedding uh, or as protection against wind when winds do howl here. Um, 
better than wolves sometimes. Uh, next. Now here's another use of antlers. And when they have got antlers near the village, they will drag them in, set them up, and then put whatever it is they want to store wrapped up in skins on top so when the snow covers, you've got this up above and it doesn't freeze into the ground. So these are storage racks for uh, meat, uh, uh, various, sometimes they, they, they catch lots of ptarmigan, uh, these are small birds, in traps and uh, can have 35 or 40 ptarmigan in one of these and they can come out and get them out for supper when they need them. Uh, so that these kinds of antlers are piled around in the wintertime, uh, around usually away from the dog yard so the dogs aren't uh, tempted. Next. Now this is a spring feature. This is what the men hide behind, uh, watching for animals and waiting for animals to come into shooting ranges. These kinds of stone features are all over the mountains. You see, we're up in the mountains here. Uh, because they know over time where the animals move, what the trails are, and when they can be expected. So they build these pretty substantial blinds so they can not be seen by the animals and can uh, inter intercept their movement. Uh, and they'll even go and get uh, uh, fresh skins and rub themselves so there's no human odor. And uh, they're very successful with these. But these are permanent. These are left in the mountains, repaired when the rocks fall down, made larger when you've got larger hunting groups. And they're all over the mountains. You can plot those out and pretty much infer what the move mobility routes of the prey animals were through the mountains. Uh, the, here's what I mean by butchering a winter animal. The head is gone here, uh, but he wants to be able to move it around uh, so he can remove the skin from the meat before actually cutting meat or cutting into the viscera. And uh, it's much easier with the head gone, with the antlers gone. Next. Uh, this is summer. Uh, we use the dogs for, for different things in summer than you'll see later at winter. Uh, dogs can carry a lot. And uh, in this case, these guys want to go. Uh, given these dip nets, we're going to get bait for bigger fish frankly, out of a, a lake. And so we're taking the dogs with us so we can leave these, this gear where we expect to fish uh, when we come back with the right size nets and so forth and so on. And the dogs will come out with something else. Now here, here's labor. This is a meat storage cellar. Look at all of them. The whole way away up on a mountain here uh, where the, you don't have really deep snow but you've got plenty of rock just underneath the tundra moss. And they put in here excess meat because in the past, this is not, they were not doing this when I was there, They're just the archeological remains. They used to go to the coast to trade pretty much annually and they would have almost a, a, a betting game who wins gets to go to the coast and eat coastal food for two months and see relatives and whatever and come back with uh, furs that they prefer to, would prefer to use or prefer to trade to the trappers down in the Yukon drainage because that's where there were a lot of uh, Anglo trappers. Uh, so they would put up stores up these. They may not, there's a high enough and cool enough all the time so that those stores may not be used for two years if you don't need them. But you've got that much ahead of the game uh, to protect yourself with this strange weather and so forth and so on. So these things are all up around the tops of mountain chains. The labor to bring the meat up and then separate, make the separation layers with willow uh, wood and uh, lay it in and then cover the whole thing up 
and have like an igloo <laughs> underneath the ground is quite an investment, but it's an investment that gives all kinds of security, particularly for winter, um, summer of food, because spring caribou are not very good. Uh, they, the cows are all pregnant and have lost most all of their good eating. Uh, the males are not with the cows in migration. Uh, the cows are going as fast as they can to the calving area, which is out beyond these mountains. And the males are dispersing in the mountains, so they're hard to find. Uh, now this is, I'm ahead of myself. What was, can we go back? No. Okay. Uh, the, 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 these can be filled up with really good food. And any kind of calamity about people uh, needing food because uh, two groups come home and you're only expecting one, we can go down here and get it. So this is all about unknown behavior people for one year, two year, three years ahead of time. Okay, Amber. Uh, this is what spring after they've hunted caribou, which they hope they don't have to use because almost always they're skinny and not got much fat on them. But they dry the meat on these drying racks. And, uh, th these, this meat may stay here and they may move their camp and leave the meat here if these maps, is, let's say there's a lake here and the mountains are up here and your camp is here at this time of year. They may leave the dry meat here so that men go into the mountains for hunting sheep can take food off the rack on the way and don't have to carry it all the way uh, along. So they route these kinds of big racks like this one to what are known pathways into the sheep hunting area of the high mountains. Uh, this is a winter site excavated to show all the marrow bones that were eaten in this winter site and tossed outside the door <laughs> in one winter. Now, these are all of the marrow yielding bones only. So what they were doing was, was getting the marrow, sometimes boiling out the grease, uh, eating the residue, and making grease cakes that the men could carry, which are lightweight, on trips into the mountains hunting at other seasons. That, in fact, is what, why there's so much here, because the family was only here, uh, I, I think, four months. In, during the winter, okay? Uh, this is a spring house, and look, <laughs> very few pieces of bone here. Uh, the, the spring caribou, are, if, they, if, if they're eating caribou meat, they're bringing in meat only, not the bones. They're not processing because the marrow is not good at this time of year. Uh, next, uh, this is a this is a hunting location for ambushing animals as they move through draws. Into the, frequently young men do this uh, to get known as a good hunter or energetic person to get a wife. Uh, and um, these are frequently occupied by teenagers. But they do a good job they, of butchering and transporting differentially. Next. Uh, here's another such spring place, and the big antlers in this case were being used to put, this is a sleeping mat, which was being dried out because the water, uh, the, the soil was damp. And these big antlers were so that they could stretch skins on it to reduce the wind while they were watching for animals to uh, decide how they were going to try to move to kill them. Uh, this is a big spring kill. Uh, there's, all of this is skin pulled off at random. The skins were in terrible shape after winter, so they didn't want them. They just wanted to get them out of the way so they could get the meat. And all of their whole skeletons in here, their partial skeletons in here, they, 
Now here's a, for those of you who know French archaeologists, that's Jean-Philippe Rigaud, who I took the Arctic one year. Uh, the hearths are over here. There's a high place, and the caribou would be coming out of the mountains into the main river valley over here. People could be working on this side of this hump, and the animals wouldn't see them. So the women are largely here because they knew where the animals were going to come from. The men are killing the animals, dragging them over here. The women are down here butchering uh, on this side so it couldn't be seen by the animals. And the men are shooting off of that berm. And uh, I forget now the count. I made M and I of animals represented here. I think it was 97, the, the day I mapped this place. Next. Uh, now here's <laughs> something that uh, traditionally in the Arctic, this is called a children's playhouse. It's not. It's when you've got a skin, and, this is, uh, and you want to get it dry, uh, you lay it out and just weight it down when the sun is high. And of course, after so many days, the sun never sets. So you got sun 24 hour days. Uh, if you wanted to process the skin that this was used here, you could have it dry enough to start in, in one day, plus it's night. And these are all around hunting camps that had females in it because the females would be, would be working these hides while the men are, are still carrying out the hunts. And in many ways, would be telling the man, I want a larger one, I want a smaller one, don't bring me any of these dinky things, and because they'd be making clothing. And, uh, and, the, and the meat was just maintenance. Next. Now, let's go to Africa. Uh, there are, I'm going to take you to a couple of places. Uh, this is called the Kalahari Hemspot Park. It's in South Africa. It's on a plateau. The whole, as I said, Africa is a plateau. Uh, it's high and very dry. And uh, this is the Kruger Park. That is a huge wildlife reserve. Uh, where the rainfall is significantly higher. I mean, there's hardly any rainfall here. Uh, a lot of more rainfall here. Much more diverse fauna, but my goodness, the animal density is amazing. So that, you know, I would think that one of those Nunamut would have thought they'd died and gone to heaven to be over here, as you will see. Uh, then we're going to jump up here. Uh, We'll look at Googles of these places, but this is the one I want to show you. This is Angorogoro Crater in Tanzania. And uh, then Olduvai Gorge is right down its north side. And so when you're sitting in uh, Murray Leakey's camp in Olduvai Gorge and look to the south, uh, that's what you see is Angorogoro, and it's just this enormous volcano with the, the caldera across it is something like 71 miles. And uh, there is a unique diversity of food there. So we want to look at that as opposed to the two kinds down here, which are flatlands, uh, more flatlands, one very dry, one wet. So yeah, there's many more animals over there. But it, it's not as easy to exploit as here because here, They've got to come to water. And over here, water's all over the place. Next. OK. OK. All right. OK. Th that was some of the pictures of the Bushmen over in the ha Kalahari Hemsbach. Uh, this is a. Now we're starting another issue. Can you go back one, two, three? Okay, this is a research team you just saw that uh, 
was gracious enough to take me into their research world, which was studying water holes. And uh, we studying predator-prey relationship at water holes, and we did numbers of these. And uh, these were the kind of uh, storage facilities we had while we were in the Kalahari Anspach. That's a dry place. So we were mainly doing uh, brown hyena and, uh, and lions over here. Next. Uh, you see the lion? Uh, he's at a water hole. She is. Uh, here's what happens to uh, giraffe that are young and don't wait. Just a moment. <laughs> uh, they go into the water being over-enthusiastic. <laughs> Here are the baboons sitting up in a tree like decorations. <laughs> now, ecosystems are complicated things. The baboons just go up in a tree when they go to the water hole, presumably to see if there's anything threatening, because they're little in the shrub. But they sit up there, and anything that comes in like a predator, like a lion or whatever, they start screaming to the tops of their voices. And you can watch other animals respond and get out of there. So there's a complicated set of relationship between the animals and the species themselves and their responses to sp stimuli. Next. Uh, I'm going to show you now. Uh, this is not all the slides of this water hole. I have. The first slide shows some zebra in thick brush. And I just saw zebra. And I photographed enough zebra, so I didn't take any photograph. And then all of a sudden, I saw the head of that giraffe above the brush coming towards me. It came up to the edge and stayed there for a minute. And as soon as it bent down, here comes the zebra. All right. Now the warthogs come. Next. Now the kudu come. Next. Uh, that is, you'll see that at every water hole in Africa. As a, the, the big animals, if an elephant comes in, or a giraffe comes in, or an African buffalo come in, the other smaller animals won't go until they go. So they will be in, in waiting. They may be thirsty, but they're not going until one of those larger animals goes in to clear the lions out or whatever it is. It could be hyenas. Uh, this is Ngorogoro Crater here. This is a huge lake, as you will see. And this has some of the highest density of African animals of any one spot in the world. And then down on the other side, is Old Rye Gorge, where all the fossils come from. Next. Uh, this is just photograph out over the bottom of Angorogoro Gorge. This is not a water hole. This is just animals. Uh, this is the salty side. All flamingos, no animals. There's a, a salt difference between the water uh, margins of the major lake uh, that uh, there's salt, you've had salt build up on one side, and the rain comes in and keeps the salt from being on the other side because of prevailing winds. And so where the animals are is where the fresh water is, and where the flamingos are is salt water <laughs> and salt pans. Uh, look at this. This is just down around the water. Uh, they're all down drinking. They're not in the sequence at this point. It's an open place that they themselves can see. And when it isn't, next. Uh, he, last night, the lions got this one. Uh, and there's one more, but I've forget, forgotten where it is. And maybe it's not in this slide. The hippo range and feed at night. They come out of the water, and it's cooler, and they feed at night. So they're preyed on more commonly in the, on the landscape, not in the water. Uh, these are hard beast, and this is uh, uh, actually is in, in Gorogoro. These are African buffalo, the forest in the background, a wonderful kudu, uh, rhino, African buff buffalo, warthog again. 
And there, this is, I'm sitting in Mary Leakey's camp at Olduvai Gorge, looking at Ngoro Goro from Olduvai here. So that's the view. The fresh water comes down here, and these whole area, the water is wonderful. The same thing happens on the other side. Uh, these are cheetah hunting uh, at, in Old Vi Gorge, and they regularly came, er, we could see them regularly, they followed the same patterns of movement, and we got, so we knew when to expect them, and if visitors came, we could all, you want to see the cheetah? And <laughs> <laughs> Next. This is one of the more common food items in archaeological sites in Africa, uh, the tortoises. And uh, there are several species of these. This is one from uh, Olduvai Gorge itself and is not exactly nor the same size as tortoises elsewhere. Uh, down near the coast, they're smaller and so forth. But these are easy to catch. They're easy to process. They're easy to eat. And so they're really very important in the food chain of early hominids in the archaeological sites. Next. Uh, this is just a Maasai, abandoned Maasai hut in Olduvai Gorge. Uh, they moved their village down closer to water. Th this was now dry. Uh, this is the thorn brush that they had up around it to keep lions out. Uh, next. These are some of the Maasai women. I, I was there, th three of us, Ronald Johansson and Tim White and myself, were doing excavations in Olduvai. And we found a hominid in OH-72. And uh, Johansson was trying to get m more money. And so he brought some, peop some people out to see what th we were doing. Uh, one of the females t decided they wanted the, the jewelry of these Maasai ladies. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know what they'd do. And I took her down so she could barter with the Maasai ladies for their jewelry. And, uh, and the, she said, you know, what do you want for your jewelry? And they said, a, a lot. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and the lady said, well, I, I'll, I'll give them more money. And they said, no, 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 we don't want money. We want cows. <laughs> <laughs> and so the lady was short of cows that day. She, <laughs> she didn't get much Maasai jewelry. Next. That's the end. So what I've tried to do is look at, just give you a brief idea of the different problems and how they're solved uh, redundantly in different settings, just that are topographically related, related to species differences and these kinds of things. And of course, what we haven't done is take that in consideration when we're looking at archaeological remains, even from the same places. And I thank you. Five minutes for uh, for a few questions, and then we can move on to the uh, to the south ballroom to uh, to eat. And uh, there's a, a book signing table right up here that you can pick up uh, Dr. Benford's books and have them signed by him or to chat with him also. So we'll just take uh, a few questions. I'm not seeing anybody. All right. Uh, where? Anup Anup yeah. Uh, the elevation there is uh, 46,000 at the tops. Uh, that's way up above the sheep line, actually. But uh, uh, that would be at the divide. Uh, and they're very rugged, they're sawtooth mountain system. That's the highest, I think. So walking is something you uh, learn to do with effort in, in that landscape. Yeah. What particular problems were people trying to overcome in the, in the dry fence spot area that you didn't get to spend much time? I, I spent more time with the animals there than I did with the people because I was working with uh, animal researchers when I was there. Uh, <clears throat> the diamond companies were, were uh, beginning to 
mined for diamonds in these drainage systems, which were described as underground rivers. The water never is on the surface. You can put pumps down and get it. It's always there, and you know it must be because these giant trees uh, are always there, but there's never any water on the surface. For some reason, the diamond company was trying to buy that land up from a South African government for exorbitant prices in order to uh, surface cut into those places that where diamonds would be concentrated because former drainage. And uh, there was a lot of people trying to say no, no. <laughs> and that, the no, no's won on that one. But that was re really why we were being paid to be out there. So what I did on my own about the animals was uh, not in line with our research demand, but we were there, you know. <laughs> uh, and the, the people were, were there, but they were frightened of us because they did, didn't trust uh, ones that they didn't know. So we saw an awful lot of warm fires and no people when we were there. Yes. The, the, there's ethnographies not done by me, but done by early anthropologists on the Ona and Yagan. Uh, and uh, and it, it's quite good because it started with uh, uh, the beagle. <laughs> and so you've got a re really good description by a very famous man uh, of what he encountered going in there. Yeah, hard. <laughs> When they, when they went into the Beagle Channel for the first time. And uh, they, uh, it's, a, it's pretty amazing there. Sketches, sketches that were made uh, by Darwin uh, in the British Museum. Uh, you don't, they're not out open where you can see them, but researchers can get uh, photographs of the documents. And the sketches are marvelous of the houses and where they, they're nested. They're just like I sh what I showed you pretty much, except where you're in uh, uh, Arctophagus, uh, one of the tree species there that has uh, very large, big pieces of wood. They would also take this that had broken down like in an ice storm and make teepee-like structures and then put uh, skins, mainly seal, on the inside and the outside, and they were pretty good houses. Uh, Darwin's got wonderful sketches of those. So it's good ethnography from down there, starting very early. And one last one. Yeah, could you uh, speak a little bit about the status of onion gathering cultures today in the world? <sighs> well, they're, 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 they're diminishing in numbers. Uh, and, and most of this is. Uh, well, uh, le let me just give you an example. You saw Anatubi when I was there. And uh, now uh, the village of Anatubi is a corporation, and they own all of the heavy equipment that services oil fields and makes all the roads, and they're the richest people in North Alaska. They don't hunt anymore. Uh, they run bulldozers and put in uh, <laughs> uh, flush toilets into glacial deposits, which is difficult to do. Uh, <laughs> but so those kinds of things can happen so fast, it's, it's, you can't believe it. The Nunamu was very gracious and wrote me a letter and asked if I would come up there and they would pay my way to take the grandchildren of the men that I worked with to the villages that they lived in because nobody there knew where they were anymore. I said I would. Uh, they notified the Bureau of Land Management that I was going to do that and that they were having trouble. I didn't know this at the time uh, because the whole village wanted to go. We had 37 Jet Ranger helicopters up there to take the entire village out I, so I could show them where their ancestors had lived <laughs> in the 1940s. It was wonderful. So change can just totally knock out 
uh, almost anything that I showed you is not going. You're not going to see that unless it's just archaeological from this and earlier periods. Uh, Africa is a bit different because Africa's got uh, there are hunters and gatherers in Africa that move with the animals, and the animals are heavily protected, and uh, they basically are some of the best defenders of that. So you've got hunters and gatherers becoming politicians, working with the World Wildlife Federation, and, and basically arguing against frequently most of what they suggest, because the World Wildlife Federation turned out to be the biggest sponsors for moving native people off the land so they could open it up to hunting for tourists. Uh, so that in, in Botswana, uh, the local people were, were moved off the land so the Germans and the Dutch could come down and get their elephant. So there's just all kinds of things you run into. You, oh my goodness. <laughs> Many of them very depressing, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. 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 Okay.